ready to get rolling wherever you are. Where'd you get that pretty little shirt? What the hell? I said, where'd you get that pretty little shirt? Well, I'll tell ya. You can get one for yourself if you head down to the Frightfully Forgotten Tea Public Store. Just click the link in the description below and get one for yourself. Hello and welcome to another episode of Frightfully Forgotten's Trash or Treasure. But before we get started, what are we drinking? Today we are drinking Wise Kraken Bud. <laughs> it's a Budweiser clone. Amazing Grace, <laughs> come, come sit, sit on my face. face. Don't make me cry. I, I need, need your pie. pie. <laughs> Today we're going to bring to you 2000's Hellraiser Inferno, the fifth installment of the series. Which makes sense, because we're just on season five that's, right now. That's right. And this one was a request from one of our fans. Uh, M. Johnson is his name. This movie was directed by Scott Derrickson, and he actually did quite a few horror-themed things here. But we're just going to mention a couple. Uh, Sinister as being one that he directed. And The Exorcism of Emily Rose. He also did the big blockbuster movies like Doctor Strange. So right. he's, he's gone up in the world. <laughs> the movie, of course, stars Doug Bradley as Pinhead. Right. For a whole two seconds. <laughs> Craig Sheffer is in this. And he's very well known for being the main character in Nightbreed. Another Clive Barker brainchild. James Remar is also in this, and he's been in tons and tons of stuff. He kind of started off in the Warriors way back when. As Ajax. Warriors! <laughs> come out to play! <laughs> that time I did that at that cookout of mine, I was all drunk and I dropped all the bombs. Yeah, no, I bro. smashed <laughs> He was also a Dexter's dad in the TV series Dexter. And Sex in the City, too. He was in that, too? <laughs> yeah. Samantha's bow. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Didn't she have several? Oh, she had, yeah. Every episode, oh, I yeah. think, was like, fuck. Uh, okay. <laughs> We're all talking about <laughs> Sex in the City. I like that show. So the movie starts out, we get introduced to Joseph Thorne, and he's this uh, hard-boiled detective, I guess you say. We see that he gets called to this crime scene, and it's this big mansion in front of this fireplace in, like, the living room. There's these chains... They're chained up to like bones and flesh and everything yep. that's just not there anymore. There's no body there anymore. <laughs> it's just all mush. <laughs> Jesus, Bob. There's a candle with a child's finger that's sort of embedded into the wax. And as a stand for the candle, it's the Le Marchand's box, yep. famous Hellraiser puzzle box. He goes home to, to his family. You know, I got a big case I got to work on, and he just takes off. Yeah, sure, big case. He drives up to a bunch of prostitutes and goes and gets one with the help of this vial of drugs that he's got. She's all hot, too. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, right. I mean, only in movies are prostitutes all <laughs> super attractive. <laughs> but she's like, you got any gum? He goes to the washroom and he has the, the box with him and he just, he's sort of rubbing it and the thing opens up and starts turning. All of a sudden he gets transported to like this house two of these Cenobites and they kind of go up to him and start kissing him and they slide their fingers right into inside his chest. Yeah. Chatterer comes too but it's only like half of him. He yeah. starts walking up the stairs. He kind of comes to after on the floor of the bathroom and it was all a dream I guess. Yeah. Right? He gets a phone call at the office from the prostitute in the room and she's getting like fucking just slaughtered. He goes in to check it out and she's just slaughtered in the bathroom. She's hanging there and all diced up and everything. And <laughs> he starts digging deep into this investigation trying to find out who this puzzle box belonged to and who the finger belonged to who's in the candle. We find out it's from a child. In the meantime, he keeps having these weird visions. He sees the tattoo of the Cenobites in the back of that Right, that guy with that <laughs> tattoo, right? You gonna fuck me or what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his snitch that he always goes to, who's now driving an ice cream truck. I'm fucking handing out drugs to kids yeah. and everything. He tells Joseph that there's this guy only known on the street by the name the Engineer who wants this box and has something to do with it. So he has to find out who this engineer is and why he wants the box and who these fingers belong to, because as more murders happen, more fingers start popping up at the murder scene. Yeah. <laughs> this poor child only has so many fingers, right? 
And that's where we're going to wrap it up. So if you want to find out what happens at the end of Hellraiser Inferno, finish watching the movie. But first, is it trash or treasure? First, the treasure of this movie. And one of the biggest treasures is the story itself, right? Not your typical Hellraiser movie, where Pinhead and his sort of clan of Cenobites sort of just basically take things over. They're not at the forefront of this movie. Which is kind of a breath of fresh air. Neat how they take this detective mystery movie and they use it as like the main plot and but have the Hellraiser part as the background. Like somehow we're gonna get there. We're gonna yeah. get to Pinhead at some point, right? So you're just waiting. Okay, when when are we gonna get to fucking the hell? Oh, I want to see him tear yeah, shit up. Yeah, with the murders, you're not sure really who's doing them because the way they film it and everything, you're not sure if it's like a Cenobite or if it's someone kind of dressed as a Cenobite because right. it kind of looks like someone wearing a mask, right? Yeah. So it could be some weird like Cenobite cult or is it the Cenobites? You're not yeah. sure. So I kind of like the the mystery part of this. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of cool ifs from both, right? Yeah. It's like if it is the real Cenobites, it means that they've breached this yeah. world, that yeah. portal or whatever, yeah. which means they're in, they're on Earth and they're kind of not supposed to be. Yeah. So they can kind of raise hell if they want. Yeah. The effects are pretty good for like a, a straight to video movie. You know, this is the year 2000, so CGI isn't rampant yet. Yeah. So you're seeing a little bit of it, right? With the tongues slithering yeah. out. Yeah. And yeah, all the practical effects are really good. The mm -hmm. Cenobites look really good. Kills are really good. There's a great scene where that ice cream man's being whipped by that, like, Cat of Nine Tails. But with, with the hooks <laughs> instead. <laughs> yeah. And you don't even see it happen. You just see the legs of the person doing the whipping and you just hear it and see all the blood and hear him scream yeah. and everything. And then you hear that ice cream man music <laughs> in the background because they're in his truck. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the atmosphere of this movie is, is another treasure. Dark, rainy, detective type atmosphere to it, which yeah. I really like about it, you know? Yeah. Kind of harks back a little bit to the first one with Frank, where he's got the box. Life doesn't excite them anymore. They, yeah. They need something more. more. Yeah. And then they find the box, and it kind of transports them to this world, but yeah. they weren't exactly up for what this world <laughs> yeah. had in store for them, right? Yeah, I didn't want that much excitement. <laughs> yeah, just throwing it back a little bit, without the tearing of the flesh and yeah. the limbs and such. <laughs> The next point we're going to make is the pacing, and this falls into both categories, mm -hmm. the trash and the treasure. The treasure aspect of the pacing is that I like how it unfolds like a mystery. Eventually, it gets like, oh, there's still like an hour yeah, left of like, the movie. And, and it's like, hey, <laughs> oh, 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 like when, when is something more gonna happen. Kind of neat thing is they use the Cenobites and Pinhead sparingly and it's like okay it's a little neat but too sparingly. Too sparingly. <laughs> like eventually like you're about three quarters into the movie like well but when? Yeah. It, now is a good time for people <laughs> to get torn apart and like okay now I want to see Pinhead and now yeah. I want to see some real madness but it's like oh uh, Ah, that yeah. it's more investigation. Yeah, more investigation, more of this weird dreamy shit. And then when you do see Pinhead finally, it's this awful CGI where, he, <laughs> where the engineer morphs with that morphing technology into Pinhead. It's like, oh! They have those shitty pins yeah, that are all... <laughs> Yeah, there are some silly parts of the movie too, which kind of take you out of the whole horror aspect. One of them is that saloon scene <laughs> where he comes in. There's that guy with like the holster and the guns and everything, and <laughs> like, looking for the engineer. Like, what like, the hell? <laughs> all those cowboys and all that karate, all those cowboy karate guys doing those kicks, and like, what the hell? Like, and then that's it for that. Yeah, then though. they just go away. Yeah, it's like what the hell. <laughs> Picks you up and puts you somewhere else. Dude, it's like a different movie yeah. almost. Yeah. <laughs> Another negative aspect about this movie is that it is kind of blatant once you get to the end of the movie that this originally wasn't a Hellraiser script. <laughs> we don't want to pay someone to write it. Let's just put Pinhead in this script. Right. Well, I guess the fact that it's got the Hellraiser name to yeah. it and everything lends credence to it, yep. and then they can make more sales off it, right? Let's try to make it work, you know? <laughs> yeah. And actually, for the most part, it does. It just, they, they could have tried harder to make it work as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Should have tried harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
you hate to say you just want to be satisfied for your own pleasure that it works out the way you want it to but I really wish it would have turned out to be more of like a um, a cult like a Cenobite cult because that's the way it, you thought it was gonna go yeah. was, the end is kind of cool and what Pinhead has to say at the end is pretty poetic and pretty awesome but at that point it's like uh, it's not enough to make up for the last you know co quarter of the movie you know Hellraiser Inferno trash or treasure treasure yeah I'm gonna say treasure too there's not enough bad about this movie mm -hmm. to make it a piece of trash it's not a movie I'd probably seek out to watch again yeah you know but you're kind of glad that you watched it anyways yeah just to sort of continue the Hellraiser yeah. thing right yeah. after this movie that is kind of enough though yeah I kind of don't <laughs> want to watch any more yeah. after because you kind of know it's only downhill from here and this was <laughs> and this was the borderline yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and it's funny that like almost every Hellraiser movie to come out after this was the same thing where it wasn't a Hellraiser movie. It's just some script that the studio had already for something else. And let's just throw Pinhead in there right. and make it a Hellraiser movie. And that's kind of why most of them from now on make no sense and <laughs> are, aren't that great. Exactly. Know? If you haven't seen it yet and you want to continue it on, uh, definitely check it out. It's worth one watch. <laughs> that's for sure because it is a treasure. Yeah. And until next time, keep drinking. Keep drinking.